Okay, we're live, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. Assalamu alaikum, brother Ali. I'm so glad to have you on. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, brother. I hope you're well, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, very good. Wallahi, alhamdulillah. We, um, Tuesdays, we come to see our beloved brother Zishan, uh, Smart Jannah, we're at his house. Uh -huh. And alhamdulillah, yeah, good. Wallahi. How are you? How's you? How's your husband? How are you? How's your family? Yes, everybody's good. Alhamdulillah, I had to get the most our seeds before I came home. <laughs> you know Inshallah. what it's like. Um, yeah. I have two daughters, so they're quite wow. young. Wow, yeah, I got, I got, alhamdulillah, three daughters. Do so, you, mashallah? Yeah, yeah. So you it's, know what they say that if you have three daughters and you clothe them and feed them and yes. look after them, that they'll yeah. be a good for you. Yeah, yeah. The hadith even says even two, and I think I think even one. So yeah, yeah alhamdulillah. They are, they are blessing, alhamdulillah. I've never had a son, but daughters, are, I don't know. what I, 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 And you know what's really interesting? Um, I mentioned this in my documentary, the marriage documentary, but my mom used to say to me, before you came to Islam, uh, I used to say that I never want to have daughters. <laughs> I actually, I, I, yeah, yeah, that's, 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 and, and I look back and I'm like, wow, did I really say that? She's like, yeah. Why she's do like, you think you said that? Because I've heard other men say that as well. I want men, to men say that. This is actually very interesting the way we're starting this because I did, I do remember saying that, but I forgot about it. So my mom used to be like, you would always be like, I never want to have daughters. And the reason being is because when you watch Marriage Documentary 1, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's my journey to basically seeking marriage as an Orthodox Muslim. I talk about my jahiliya, I talk about coming to Islam. And um, <clears throat> yeah, and in a nutshell, basically, it's because in the documentary you will see, I'm, I was warning, um, and when I came to Islam, when I started my YouTube channel, I had a show called The Reality Show. I don't know how long you've been following me, how early. But very the very beginning, I had I used to have a show called the reality show, and I used to heavily warn women against men. And in the marriage documentary, I actually because um, as would oh this is actually live. I thought it was pre recorded, but anyways, in in marriage documentary episode two when it comes out, I was actually warning women against the man who I used to be. So when men say they don't want to have daughters, it comes from a place of they know how they were towards women, so they don't want another man being like them towards their daughters. So when I would say that, it's because I used to be a, and look, I was never physical in the sense where like, you know, yep. yeah, I was never like like that to even the haram relationship that I was in for five years. You know, she testifies that we, we try to find her, we track her down, alhamdulillah. She agrees to an interview. Um, well, actually she rejects it first, but anyways, things unfold in a, in a specific way. But even that, so I wasn't, but again, uh, the kind of man that I was, that my society made me, um, yeah, that's why men do that because they do not want they look how terrible they are. They were. They look at how their friends were, and so they were thinking, "I don't want. I don't want a daughter. Like I don't want a daughter to come to this, um, to this uh, world." And if you look at the Quraysh, for example, the Mushrikeen, uh, the time of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, one of the reasons they used to bury their daughters alive was because of the shame, because they had this perception that if they was to go to war, the the woman would be taken as captives and be, you know, so. It's that, and we need to understand with the dynamics we, which I talk about this. For example, we did a show on the Bitter Truth podcast, inshallah, maybe you yourself and your husband can maybe one day it'd be an honor to have you guys. Um, yeah, so we talk about this, about, you know, why does a man care about a woman's past so much? You know, it's it's just, it's in Islam, zina is zina. Adultery is adultery. For a man or a woman, there is no distinction between it. However, socially, things change a bit uh, because the act um, of intimacy is being... Um, done to like you would you would never have somebody come and say like you you have men insult another person's mother sister daughter, but it's never the opposite way. You never have someone say um, like the opposite. You get it? it's not an insult. So I think it's those dynamics that play a role where men feel as if you know if they were to find out their daughter or their mother or sister you know as a boyfriend or somebody talks it really boils their blood it's the ghira i don't know so in a nutshell sorry to make the question the oh, answer no, long it's... but the, it's yes i i used to be like that where i would be like i don't have daughters and i look now and i'm like i'm the, like it's the best thing that's ever happened to me and that's why i always say islam made a woman human in my eyes before they want not and that's because of my society in a nutshell yeah. if that answers your question yeah yeah it's definitely true brother when we had our first daughter it was a blessing and then the second time she was quite um not that she was quite quick after the first everyone was like oh you didn't have a son and I was like, no. mm. 
No. But they're sisters, alhamdulillah. They'll be together. Yeah. They'll grow up together. Inshallah, yeah. Allah gives us a son a great blessing. But yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't matter. And even if it's a son, it doesn't. And to be honest, it's very interesting because most of the times, women were blamed in history for not giving birth to a son. But a lot of recent studies show that it's actually it's actually the men, the man that's determined because he's the one. The man has the X and Y chromosome. The woman yeah, has yeah. the X. So it's not really her fault. If there's anyone's fault, it's actually the man's fault because he's. You get what I'm trying to say? If yeah, he was yeah. down to use that argument, and it's it's, it's yeah, yeah. so silly. Yeah. I have used the argument before. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Brother Ibrahim is on, Brother Ibrahim X, and he's just said that very good to see you speaking. Very glad Ali's addressing your projection when it comes to not wanting doctors, mashallah. Yeah, I just wanted to mention him because he's put that in, which is great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, uh, so we did start off with doctors, but I actually wanted to start off with your revert story. I did see it, mashallah, your... If I can say first, brother, I actually thought you were Pakistani. I don't know if you've got that before. I think it's because of uh, yeah. Some people do that because maybe because of the shape of my nose. Maybe some people say <laughs> that. I've got I've got I've got like North African, a Moroccan, Algerian. Yeah, I, I have got Pakistani before. Yeah, I have. Yeah. Yeah, I have had. I thought you were Pakistani Muslim. I thought you were born Muslim. It's not yeah. like your reverse story, and I was like, oh, he's not a Muslim. I know you've some of your family were Shia Alawi, which is a type of. I don't think it's a type of Islam, really. It's no yeah. Yeah, it's not my mom. My mom is uh, what my mom was. Uh, my dad is atheist, but most of them, I'll be honest with you, from the Alawi community, from because there's Syrian Alawis, uh, there's Turkish Alawis, there's Kurdish Alawis as well. But the ones here, they 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 outright atheists. Mm -hmm. they, they they call themselves Alawi, but it's very bizarre. They literally they they outright atheists. They have no belief in anything. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's it's and even the ones that are Alawi who they follow, like it's it's you cannot call them a Muslim. It's impossible. They reject like Quran. They, they reject like yeah we don't fast 30 days you know we don't wear hijab we don't pray we don't yeah it's just it's yeah it's yeah we can i don't think we can ever identify them as a muslim okay well, can we briefly hear about your first story i don't know quite about that if anybody yeah. that's never seen you before can you maybe share your journey to islam yeah to be honest my journey to islam was like i moved from north i used to live in um north london most of my life so from north london i moved up um i moved I used to get into a lot of trouble here with gangs and fighting and stuff like that. My dad moved me up north, north east Lincolnshire. That's when I went from one specific Jahiliya to another form of Jahiliya. So that other form of Jahiliya was me, gangs, fighting, all that kind of stuff, to clubbing, girls, partying. So then from there onwards, um, yeah, so from there onwards that I started to get back into my education because when I was in London, I got kicked out of schools. Um, you know, I didn't do my GCSE, so when I went back there, I was doing my key skills, got back into college, did business studies, got some good grades. I got, you know, alhamdulillah, I got that distinction, etc. I thought to myself, you know, I believed in myself. Um, and then from there onwards, um, I used to go partying, holidays, clubbing, girls, all that kind of stuff. And I started thinking to myself, you have this existential crisis. Usually people have it towards a certain age. Certain age. But to me, I was just like, why am I here? Like, what's the purpose of all of this? Why am I here? Where am I going? What's all this about? And there was a brother, a Bengali brother, who um, I used to work in his restaurant. I used to like do delivery driving and I used to like wash the dishes, etc. And I used to like go uh, college. So it was just something, just making some money on the side. And yeah, from there, you know, it's um, I was in a haram relationship for five years um, and I was really close with the mom because she was half white, half Pakistani. Okay. So the mom was a white English lady and she was an amazing very amazing woman uh like a, like a motherly figure to me um i have some kind of a communication with her till this day i used to celebrate christmas with them i used to celebrate easter with them uh you know i used to put the star on the tree you know the uh, <laughs> on the christmas tree so yeah like buying gifts I, I used to wrap up the gifts so i used to do all of that um and i one day i think in the house i i started reading the bible because i was just intrigued you know like i just wanted to know and the journey started from there, you know, I was just bored of clubbing and partying and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So this brother who I used to work with, he took me after work one day, went upstairs and he showed me videos of Ahmed Didad, Zakir Naik. And he just said, watch these videos, you know, if you have any questions. He took me to Tarawi once and I hated every second of it. I think they, I think they prayed 20 rakah. And so I was what, in the... First time for someone this is my first time. Ever. No, I'm not even a Muslim. He just said to me, come and have the experience. I was like, okay. I went off which is going to be probably five minutes. I was there for like an hour or something. And I hated every second of it because the, the position to sit down when you're, when you're praying, when you're sitting down, my feet were killing. I couldn't go anywhere because I'm right in the middle. I could, behind these people. 
and I hated every second. I'll be honest with you. I thought to myself, I'm never ever coming to this place ever again in my life. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's it's it's, it's from there. Uh, then I started binging on Ahmed Ida, Zaki Naik, Khalid Yasin, Abdul Rahim Green. Just binge watch. I I think I watched the videos twice again. And it's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was preparing me for dawah because I had misconceptions about Islam. Why can a man marry four times? Why mm -hmm. this? Why that? Da, da, da. And I was getting the answers to those. It's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was preparing me to do dawah because I was knowing the answer to these questions. So, and me, alhamdulillah, I've done marketing before. When I left that North East Lincoln shine, I moved back to London to start university. In London, met, I did banking and finance. Um, when I moved back here, it's um, it's just from there I started my own business, and after I started my own business, um, I left that because I thought it involved riba, and then I came to Islam. So in a nutshell, yeah, it's like my journey from there. It's it's you know, and and I spent a good two years, two to three years, where I was battling myself off like I'm still committing sins, I still have these bad habits, um, and accepting Islam. So I had this. A lot of people have this perception. Oh, once I've stopped sinning, then I'll accept Islam. It doesn't work like that. You know, you accept Islam and that will help you stop sinning, not the other way around. So I was having this inner conflict where I was like, one day, um, inshallah, I would. But one day I had enough. I was just like, you know what? Forget this. I hated the sins that I was committing. I was driving past East London Mosque and I parked my car, went inside and I just took my shahada and one of the brothers taught me how to pray salah. Alhamdulillah. In a nutshell. That, that's, it's a beautiful story and it'll help other people that are struggling to go through that. How did you end up doing the dawah work online? Because that's quite a big jump for a revert to do, um, especially if you don't have much knowledge of it. Um, so the dawah work, um, did you say, why did I start doing dawah with limited knowledge? Yeah. Well, to be honest, the thing is, I was basically, when I, when I was looking to Islam for those years, I had some, I, I gained knowledge on how to answer certain shubahat. So from there onwards, I knew a lot of ways to answer it but when it came to the creed the aqidah of our religion uh, that's where i was lacking but then what happened is about a year into it i started obviously looking more into it what we believe etc you know where is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like all this kind of stuff so then i started doing that so the first year was not um it wasn't it shouldn't i should have not been doing dawah in that sense uh but still it wasn't that i was saying things that can be misguiding it's just if if somebody pulled me up on it i would have been in trouble i handled like they didn't but slowly slowly obviously gaining knowledge studying with my teachers had different teachers etc and slowly slowly growing it was just like putting into um you know teaching they say the best one of the best ways to learn is by uh, uh, to memorize is to teach so yeah from there on was gaining knowledge slowly 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 acquiring it slowly slowly and yeah and not talking about matters that i don't know if i don't know something brother i don't know like allah says in the quran if you don't know Ask somebody that knows. So I would say, you know, I don't know the answer to that question. Maybe this brother would. Yeah, that's a good uh, way to start. That's sort of how I started as well, brother. I've learned so much since I've started yeah. talking to other people and um, research you have to do for videos as well. Yeah. So we really do learn a lot through doing Bawa online. Sorry, brother, there's still a little bit of an echo. <laughs> oh, let me, let, me, let me mute myself one second. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, thank you. That's perfect. Um. So uh, do you have any advice for anybody that's thinking about starting Dawah online that would like to start a YouTube channel or wants to be successful in regards to what type of mindset and actions do you think that they should have? Can you repeat that again? So what kind of mindset should a person who's in the Dawah have? Uh, who wants to start doing Dawah online. Okay, the first thing that I would say to a person who wants to do Dawah online, number one, Dawah is, people need to understand something. Dawah is not something that could... Be done online there is no conditions in the dawah that says for you to do dawah you have to be online you don't have to be online you can do dawah to your neighbors you can do dawah to your friends you, so so please understand that dawah yes like even me when i first started going speaker's corner i didn't necessarily have this perception where i was like i have to be on camera i actually didn't want to be on camera i was happy going speaker's corner but there was a brother that i used to work with brother imran may allah bless him inshallah dawah man where he was like, you know, why don't you do videos? And I said, bro, I'm not comfortable, man. I'm happy going to Speaker's Corner, having my little discussion there, doing my bit, halas. And he was like, nah, just try it. And my first two videos were filmed on my phone. So I tried it, people benefited, and I thought, okay, why not? So that's where I carried on. Otherwise, I had no intentions of ever thinking, I want to become a YouTuber, I want to do video, nothing. Well, like, I had no intentions of doing YouTube videos. I went to Speaker's Corner, 
I saw people lying about Islam and I felt passionate and I wanted to defend it. And just from there onwards, he just encouraged and said, you know what, maybe do a video. And then it just it just grew from there, you know, it just from that, I just thought, you know, what? I've got nothing to lose. Why not if people benefit? Obviously, as public figures, we have intention problems. And till this day, I still have intention problems. I ask Allah to forgive me every day for those corrupt intentions. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enables and purifies my intentions. And as a public figure, I will tell everybody, focus on your private deeds. Because I'm not going to stand in front of Allah and say, I've done dawah. I'm so sorry, I cannot rely on that. Because my intentions are one day for me, one day against me. So I want to go with something that I'm certain of, which is the private deeds that I do that only me and my Lord knows. Sometimes not even my wife. Nobody knows except me and my Lord. So the point is that, in a nutshell, so any public figure that's out there, they shouldn't, like I'm not concerned. If someone comes and says to me, do you think your videos do the job? I go, I have no doubt. And I don't want to sound arrogant. I have no shadow of a doubt. And this is not just me. For anybody that's doing videos, you can, your video sister, they benefit people. Yes. My only concern is, is it accepted from me? Is my intentions in the right place? I don't worry about is my videos doing the job. I'm sure everybody's videos are doing their job. If anybody gives Nasir, I'm sure it's doing something good. We need to see if our intentions are on point. And that again is another battle within itself because that's a battle you sometimes win, you sometimes lose, you sometimes draw. But my private deeds is a battle which is a win-win. Mm -hmm. It's between me and my Lord. It's private, alhamdulillah. I, that's good. That's what I'm going to stand in front of my Lord with. And guess what? As a public figure, they should push you to do more private deeds. You're right, brother, for 100%. Yeah. I've heard from a lot of reverts that they've said that other people giving them dawah, just friends that they've had and some friends is what's led them to Islam, not people online. So you're definitely true about that. And in terms of dawah and intention, um, yeah. you're 100% right. I've also seen a recent video of someone saying that, you know, people give dawah and want paid to give dawah, and that's another reason why they give it. Intentions, for sure, have to be pure. Yeah. I think it's very, very important when it comes to this matter because a lot of people have this perception like, you know, like, why are you doing dawah or this, that? Look, wallahi, these things, um, uh, these things, alhamdulillah, I think one of uh, the team members are watching this video. They're asking me when we're going to have a meeting. I'll just message them through here. We're going to have the meeting, inshallah, around 9, 9 p.m. maybe. I might not be coming to that, by the way. Yeah, so around 9 p.m., just so you know, they're asking me, like, when is it? I'm watching it. Okay, so about 9 p.m., inshallah, yeah? yeah? If you're watching this, salam alaikum to from here. Uh, uh, might not be. I'll let you know, yeah? It's supposed to go somewhere with Zishan. So, basically, yes, like, for example, for about four to five years, I didn't monetize my uh, videos. Why? Because, number one, there's haram ads, yeah? So, I do not want to, like, I do not, I never had the intentions of, Mixing dawah with money or making money, yeah? It shouldn't be like that. Why? Because I know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who's created the entire heavens and the earth and the whole universe. So to me, I know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to provide for me. My motto in life is very sim simple, sister, yeah? Mm -hmm. I expect the least and I make dua for the best. Mm -hmm. That's my motto in life. I don't know if it's good or if it's not bad. That just works for me. I expect the least because I'm not, so I don't be disappointed and I make dua for the best. If I'm happy with this and Allah gives me this, I'm more than happy. Do you get it? So the thing is that, in a nutshell, that a couple of years ago, we got a fatwa. We spoke to a couple of people and YouTube allowed us to block ads. So I blocked gambling, dating, women's wear, um, riba, all that kind of stuff. Do you get it? So my intentions, was it from the get-go to make money off YouTube? No. Now, is this necessarily bad? No, it might be somebody that wants to do dawah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they want some kind of income. It's all well and good. I'm talking about myself as Ali, as an individual. So mm -hmm. to me, Alhamdulillah, when I monetized it, Alhamdulillah, I make some kind of a living. I still do some work here and there, like with Iman channel, etc. But the thing is what? Carry money in your hand, not in your heart. I don't go out my way of like, I need to go and do this and do that. And I look, look, wallahi, money can be a big fitna. And today's time, wallahi, I see that the dawah is becoming a business. Yes. And that is not right. It's not correct. Now, I'm not saying you cannot. Look, there are people who need to be paid. They need to because they need to feed their family. People want us to eat grass. Like, it, doesn't, it doesn't work like that. The point is that, of course, but to go to the limits of, yeah, you know, oh, yeah, hi, can we book you two? One second, let me, let me act it out. Yeah, uh, Brother Ali, can you come to Canada? Oh, yeah, of course I can. First class ticket, business ticket for me. <laughs> and imagine if I had a couple of wives as well. Yeah, for me and my three wives as well. Yeah, make sure all of them first class. Yeah, and also want 10,000 pounds. Fear Allah, what the hell is wrong with you? You know, like, you, Yani, this, this, true, 
it causes people to mistrust individuals, mm -hmm. you know. And as people in the Dawah, we have a great responsibility. Mm -hmm. We should not be known as people of benefit of, oh, it's all about money. He wants to make this. No, we should be known as people who are honorable. I hope we are. We are genuine. We are sincere. We want good for people. We should be known for that. Not, oh, did you hear that Dawah guy who asked for this? Or that Dawah guy who uses his power to mess around with girls? We should not be known for this stuff. So to me, it's so dangerous. People come into this and thinking the fame can ruin you. Yes. Shahaytham, may Allah have mercy on him. He's always been some kind of a mentor for me. He said to me, watch out for free things, Ali. And I said, what is that, Shaykh? He said, money, mm -hmm. fame, and the top of the list, woman. <laughs> Wallahi. Now, this doesn't mean women are... Yani, uh, it's a thing is we know that from the Quran, we know from the Prophet Sallam, the biggest fitna that the, the Prophet Sallam was hit Ben Israel was the fitna of women. Now, what does this mean? Does this mean women inherit the evil? No, because we don't believe that. In the Bible, for example, for example, it says that because Eve tempted Adam, this is the reason why women, when they give birth, they suffer the pain. That's nonsense. We don't believe that in Islam. We don't believe women are inherently evil. No, of course not. You know, we know the four best women to ever walk this earth as well. Mm -hmm. But the biggest weakness for a man is a woman. Mm -hmm. Since I've come to Islam, now, I'm not a money mot motivated person. And I saw this to Sheikh Haytham. I said, Sheikh, I'm not a money motivated person. Fame can, yep, it can get to me. I have to ask Allah to protect me. Woman, pff, sister, let me tell you something. <laughs> I, when, it, when it comes to this, wallahi, I make dua in sajda. From when I remember, a long time ago, and I always say, Oh Allah, protect me from the fitna of women. It's all men, brother. It's not all men. No, yeah, yeah, it's all men. There was a sheikh, I think it was a sheikh Uthaymeen. He's like in his 60s or 70s. I can't remember. He said, he's 60, 70, 70 years old. He said, The biggest thing I fear for myself at this age is a woman. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. I, you know, my husband, we have the same conversation and he says the same thing. And I've spoken to men recently who have two wives, three wives and women are like, oh, my gosh. But you, actually, that's why Allah has put that in there, because men, that is what they desire most of all and um, we will get on to women. That is some of the questions I have. But I wanted to stick to when you reverted and I know your family were originally um, not very happy, which I was very sorry to hear. And that must have been a very hard time for yourself um, and to make such a big decision and, you know, have the people that you love the most not back you in that decision. But I know since then I've seen a video and that your mother and brother, and um, Alhamdulillah, have become Muslim, which you must be very happy about. How is that situation with the rest of your family? Anybody else that, and I know some of your cousins were looking into Islam. How, how is that? Is that a family situation now? You know, situation right now, Wallahi, it's, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works in such miraculous ways. My mom, my, my, my brother and my mom took their shahada about, I would say about a good four or five years ago. Wow. I was making dua. I've always, I always make dua for my dad, my mom and my brother. Mm -hmm. My brother, I've been specifically asking for the past two years that he starts praying salah. I mean, that's for my mom as well. My brother, about five months ago, started praying. And my mom called me and he said, you know, your brother's starting praying. And I was like, nah. He was like, yeah, your brother's starting praying. And I, I was shocked. I was like, really? And, and I was like really taken aback. I was like, in my sense, in my head, I was thinking, oh my gosh. Like when you see, when you make a dua and you see it come to life, it's, 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 it's such an amazing feeling. That's why the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said the biggest power for, the biggest weapon a believer has is his dua. Mm -hmm. And after that, I gave him, you know, we have an organization called Salam. So at Salam, we have a project called Salah Plus. So it is basically, in a nutshell, us, we have a guided prayer mat. I don't know if you've seen it. I've seen some of your adverts. Yes. yes. So it's a guided prayer mat, which we give for free because people donate towards it. And, and I'm a volunteer at that organization. I don't get paid a single penny. And not that there's anything wrong with it. It's just I choose not to. So it's a guided prayer mat, alhamdulillah. We raise funds for that and we send it out internationally. Um, if it's international, they just have to pay for the postal fee because it's expensive. Uh, it's like five pounds and if we send a thousand it's gonna cost us five thousand to send a thousand so yeah they pay for it so we do that and we also have instructors so i'm one of the instructors where if there's a brother who took shahada i can teach him how to pray salah spend the whole day with him teach him step by step so i gave him one of those prayer mats and he's been praying with that my own brother has been praying salah and my mom once called me and she goes you know your brother's waking up for fajr morning prayer like my mom doesn't know fajr but she said morning prayer and i was like no way 
because my brother's a little bit lazy, yeah? <laughs> so, yeah. and I was thinking, Fajr, I was like, La ilaha illallah. Like, to me, it just shows the power of dua. And I'm making dua now, inshallah, and I've made a little group, and alhamdulillah, and different people in my family. I was in Edmonton Mosque, in, I don't know, sister, do you live in London, or are you? Are you... Um, Glasgow, Glasgow, Scotland. Okay, Glasgow, okay. So, in London, there's Edmonton Mosque. One day I'm at Edmonton Mosque, I'm walking out, and I see someone that looks very familiar. They're in like, they've got like a kind of a shamakh and they've got a phobe. And I'm thinking, I know this guy. Where do I know this guy from? <laughs> and then I'm like, this is my bloody cousin. And I look at him, I go, his name, his name is Ferhat. And I'm like, Ferhat, what, what are you doing here? <laughs> and he's like, what do you know what I'm doing here? I've come, I've come to pray Juma. I was like, okay, but I'm just like, what, the, what, what are you doing here? And he was like, yeah, I've accepted this time a couple of years ago. And he even has his own YouTube video where he does the podcast. And he's he's on it like he stepped up like not, he stepped up a notch. I'm scared to go out with the phobe because of my family. They might call the MI5 on me. Yeah, <laughs> he's outright wearing a phobe and he's going full out. I spoke to him. He's a little bit young blooded as well. So I said to him, "Listen, calm down." He's like, "I'm going to go Egypt. I'm going to do this." I was like, "Look, listen, listen to your mom. Calm down a bit. Yeah, the last thing we need is you know you get it. So you need to take yeah. it easy." So I spoke to him and he said, "You know what? Thank you because I'm you know a bit zealous, etc." And I gave him some uh, guidance. And I realized from the community that I come from, the Alibi community, there are so many of them coming to Islam. I've actually made a group and there's so many of them. I've, I've added my brother, my cousin, my other cousin, and we've just made a little community where we meet up every month. And Allah works in mysterious ways, Wallahi. And that's why I say to every reaver, if I'm not mistaken, sister, you're a reaver? No, no, I'm not born Muslim. Oh, okay. Where are you from, sister? I'm from Scotland, Glasgow. So I was born Muslim, but then... You know, Islam sort of wasn't the forefront of my mind growing up. Like a lot of Western Muslims, it's not till I had my my children, I got married, that really. really so, happened. where are you originally from, sister? Pakistan. Oh, okay. So, okay. Sorry, I'm thinking you're a re white river sister. Okay. So, I I'm a bit yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, Spana. So, yeah. Um, I forgot what point I was going to make. Sorry, well, I totally forgot. Your I don't family, know why I asked. In your community. No, I forget. it's okay. It's gone. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Zishan's laughing. It's just... Yeah, I forgot. It. I, I can't remember it. But anyways, yeah. May Allah bless you, inshallah. I, did, I didn't know that. Yeah, so my grandparents are originally from Pakistan. Um, my mom and dad are both born British. And um, I was born British, my brother and my sister. We grew up in a family that was... Oh, that's it. I remembered. I remembered. So what I was going to say, is, so forgive me, sister, sorry to cut you like that, sorry. Uh, so, so in a nutshell, what I was saying is that every revert that comes to Islam, they are like an ambassador. Allah picks those individuals so that they can spread the message of Islam in their family. That's why I say to every revert, Allah has picked you, not just for you, but um, through you, many people in your family are going to come to Islam. That's what I wanted to say. Sorry, carry on. I'm glad that you said that because... I've been speaking to so many reverts. There's so many reverts that are watching just now. And that is one of the things that they struggle with the most is their families. You know, they think my families are not going to go to Jannah with me. What do I do? How do I make them Muslim? Um, what advice do you have for them? I mean, obviously do dua and um, I'm assuming lead by example, right? The biggest thing that I tell people is this. Dawa is not what you say with your mouth. Mm -hmm. Dawa is not just what you just utter. Mm -hmm. Like, Oh, you know, I'm um, sound like Zakir Naik, like wow. Well, like it means nothing to your family. It can mean nothing to your family. Mm -hmm. They look at what kind of a person you've become. They look at your actions. That's why I tell people, your actions, the way you carry yourself. People, well, like, why do you think the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he came with a message of Islam, why do you think so many people couldn't doubt him? And the ones that doubted him, they had an issue within their heart because they knew his character when they knew his character and knew he was the truthful the trustworthy when he came and said i'm the prophet of allah people had to be like this man cannot be lying do you see how his character was a it's like vouching for him mm -hmm. so i say the same thing to reverts mm -hmm. don't come to islam and start going on a mad one. Oh, take down pictures in the house no dogs allowed please don't be so silly mm -hmm. have some wisdom Mm -hmm. These people are going to say, wow, this is exactly what we was fearing. Be gentle, understand, listen to your mom. There are certain things, like I spoke to my cousin. I told my cousin, I said, bro, is your mom happy with you wearing a phobe? He's like, not really. I said, bro, I'm telling you clearly, you are in an act of disobedience. The phobe is not, wearing the deen doesn't say it's fart. You need to cover your aura. Yeah, this doesn't mean you have to wear a phobe. I will tell him, bro, if this making your mom happy, take it off. Mm -hmm. Because that is, be clever. 
be clever. Use hikmah. You want her to come to Islam. Don't make her dislike it. Like, if she doesn't like it, no problem. My mom hates the phobe. Hates it. I, I sometimes wear it in my house. Even then, she doesn't like it. Why do you have to wear this thing? Pray your salah. Do this. But why do you have to wear this thing? You know, you look like this, this. I'm like, okay, whatever. But obviously, I don't say that to her. But I'm like, in my head, okay, mom. So the thing is, is that I know she doesn't like it. So I'm like, what's the point? Of me, what am I trying to do? Like, I'm not saying my cousin does this. Like, we're trying to look whole. No, folk is nice to wear. It's comfortable. But the point is what? If it's my mom's right, overrides it. And a lot of people don't know this. Do you know that when you're praying your sunnah salah, if your mom calls you, you have to break your salah? Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, your mom's hug. For example, if you are fasting, if you are fasting, your mom, or let's say, for example, your brother in Islam or your sister in Islam says to you, Come and eat with us. It's a sunnah fast, by the way, not a fard fast. Mm -hmm. If it's a sunnah fast, you have to break your fast. Because the right of your brother oversees that. You still get the reward, the intentions, mm -hmm. up to the time you fasted, yes. But your brother's haq. That's why some say, if I go to a specific masjid, and they put their hands here, and they're very strict about it, and I put my hands down here, just so there's harmony, I will let go of that, and I'll pray just like them. Mm -hmm. They don't say, ameen. I won't say, ameen. Just so there is, there's unity. Not, oh, I'm going to start acting, getting a piety attack. I'm like, no, I'm going to say, please. That, you know, so that's what I tell people. Thank you, mashallah, brother. Thank you for sharing that. There's actually a brother I revert on just now, Brother Mikhail. Um, he just put up a comment to say, Assalamu alaikum, sister and Ali. Happy to see your growth, sister. Thanks. Thank you, Ali, for helping inspire me in my final steps to revert to Islam as an Italian shukran. Um, uh, he's a new revert, getting ready for nikah. And um, we're going to talk about marriage soon, brother. So don't worry, we'll hopefully give you some advice. Hopefully, brother, brother Ali will give you some advice. And he said he DM'd you on IG, brother. Uh, thank you for that comment. Um, that's actually what we wanted to, I wanted to move on to next was um, marriage. You're a family man, you're happily married, you have children, you said three daughters. Um, what? How old are they? Can I ask what their, their age gap is? Okay, one is, so we have six. Um, I prefer not to. Okay, that's yeah, fine. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not, yeah, enough to do with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Not, not older, to, just, not just, say that again they're older they're not babies <laughs> some are babies by the, by, the, by the way just want to address this yeah a lot of people have this thing where um and it's good there's a balance between it some people do not mention like when it comes to the personal life i think nobody should have the intention of putting it in public for no reason at all so there's mm -hmm. two extremes there's one extreme where for example mm -hmm. someone who prays the salah stays away from major sins Gives the haq of Allah, does their adkar. There's one extreme where it's they do that adkar and they are still in like they're scared. Like, oh my gosh, I'm like, brother, you do your adkar, yeah. And this, this doesn't mean you should go out and be like, yes, by the way, you know, I'm this or my wife. No, no, you don't need to mention that. But I'm just saying, some people are too cautious as if the evil eye is stronger than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. The other extreme is these people who don't do the adhkar, they don't pray, and everything is out. Yani, you will think this person is a mu'min. He is so sure that his adhkar is going to protect him. They're full mm -hmm. outright. Now, my one is not coming from either. It's not because I fear it's evil, nothing because of that. It's just personal and i just yeah but otherwise yeah yeah there are yeah there are there are some babies there <laughs> in, in, in a nutshell <laughs> yeah i respect that brother because yeah. i have two daughters and they're quite young i don't put them on social media i yes. don't say their name um i'm very careful and it's it's just a protection thing as a parent you want to protect your children it's not to you know keep a secret or what's a secret it's just a protection thing so i completely respect that um what's it like to be a father can i ask you that what are the biggest challenges because you have daughters so i know you know, my husband is so protective over his girls <laughs> yeah to be honest like as a father you know you're going to have that you know and yeah it's it's like as a father it's it's an amazing feeling because what it is is that sometimes okay for example you have different forms of love mm -hmm. you have a love towards your mother Mm -hmm. You have a love towards a sibling, your brother or your sister. You have a love towards your spouse. Mm -hmm. But you, when you have a child, you realize that there is a whole new different form of love that is there that you only explore when you have a child. You know, and for a mother, it must be on a different level because as a father, of course, to us is great as well. But I'm just imagining as a mother that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you in that way. 
how magnificent it must have been that connection that you have with your child so mm -hmm. to me it just it, it just opened that door to a different form of love a different form of care you know a, a different kind of uh, form of protection so it's like it's, it's amazing just coming home and knocking the door and my daughter daughter's running to the door it's mm -hmm. a feeling that it's very interesting that I actually drive home a little faster too. Like mm -hmm. it's something where I don't mind being caught on a speed camera. It's like, it's that feeling where it's just like, I, and I say that sometimes I, t I call my wife out, make sure they're not asleep. Yeah, uh, I, I want to see them before they go to sleep. And she really never understood that until I think, when was it? I think one day she was out, she had the car, I was at home with the kids. And she, she was like, wow, she goes, being away from them, she goes, I understood what you, kind of what you was going through. And to me, it was like, yes, coming back to them, driving back home to them, just opening door and just seeing their smile of excitement of seeing me. Yeah, it's that to me was um, priceless. And yeah, I have that. Like when I'm going home, sometimes I will have to leave a certain time where I'll be like, I want to get home on time so I can see them. And I get disappointed when they're asleep. I'm like, oh, man, like I really wanted to like put them to sleep or, you know, read them a, like story or do you yeah. get what I'm trying to say? It just, you know, just put it or just rub, rub, rubbing my daughter's back. You know, she just she loves that. You know, sometimes she'll call out my name. You know, she's funny. Yeah, these days she, she doesn't, she's not calling me Baba, she's calling me by my name. Ali, Ali, Ali. And I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. So cool. yeah, she's, 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 she's Sunni, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that, I just, just clarified. Not that there's anything with our Shia brothers. Just saying, that, Alhamdulillah, you know, it's just, it's, it's a little joke, inshallah. Yeah. Inshallah, that's beautiful. I, I, I understand what you're saying, but I also understand what your wife is saying. Because your wife yeah. is all the time so yeah. i'm with my kids all the time and i'm like i need a break and then after an yeah. hour i'm like where's my babies i need to yeah come yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's how Allah like, subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you yeah mashallah it, it's a beautiful thing and my babies brought me back to islam and made me look at my faith differently it's why i wear a hijab now so i'm very blessed to have the two of them um, mm. how would you as a practicing muslim and dad advise fellow muslims to bring up boys and girls now especially in the west i don't know if you have this issue up well you will have this issue down there we have this issue up here about schooling yeah what schools do we put them in i don't want my children to go to western schools if i can i would rather they go to islamic schools and um, you know there's islamic schools down south up here in scotland we don't have public islamic schools but i know down in manchester and other uh, other cities down there they do have that or homeschooling um I created a fellowship so all Muslim mums and dads can get together and learn how to bring up their kids in the West. Do you have any advice for, for Muslim mums and dads that are struggling, want to keep their kids away from all the haram? Well, I'll be honest with you. I don't want to give <clears throat> advice on a matter that I need advice on. So I'll be honest with you. If there's anyone that can give advice, I would love to be one of those because I'm in that predicament where I do not know what to do myself. Like I'm in a situation where I'm like, what can I do? You know? Like, or like, do you get what I'm trying to say? Like, I'm in that predicament myself. So I don't want to do injustice by answering for the sake of it. I genuinely, it's hard. Like I'm thinking of homeschooling. I'm mm -hmm. thinking of private. If I had the money, mm -hmm. it's, 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 yeah. So I'm in that predicament. I mean, if you have any tips, I would love to hear. And if you, I, I'm in that predicament. So I have, I'm literally searching, speaking to people. So yeah, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know at this moment in time. I've been doing the same, brother, because I, you know, we've got, you know, you've got daughters, I've got daughters, and for some reason, I mean, maybe I'm, tell me if I'm wrong, but for, for me, daughters are more precious than sons, especially when it comes to things like haram, how I want them to dress, how I want them to act. We just try and create Islamic culture in our home so that from a young age, they just grow up like that. We've been to Islamic schools and there was a school in Manchester that we went to. It was a public school. They teach everything, you know, they teach all the LGBT stuff, but they teach this is right, this is wrong. Um you know, the teacher curriculum. But the one thing that the, the head teacher said was that in the school, all the, the girls wear hijabs. And if you don't wear a hijab, you're the odd one out. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. You know, I want my daughter to come to this school. So um, also I've heard a lot of people say they homeschool their kids together with other Muslim parents. You know, they all get together and they homeschool together. So inshallah, um, we can all bring our children up well. Um, yeah. I, I would say on that statement I think you're correct sister But I think one thing that I might just disagree with you on there yeah. Is that when it comes to this thing A lot of us um, And it can be subconsciously in our mind mm -hmm. But I think that it's true in the sense But we should also um, discipline our sons as well 
Like there is an emphasis on girls, of course. Like with girls, they're more delicate. They are more like, for example, they can be corrupted easily. They are easily influenced. That's why the Sharia has specific legislations and laws in place when it comes to the woman. The obedience to the husband, not leaving the house without the permission of the husband, you know, having a guardian and from the guardian it goes to, the, you know, this. So there's this whole system in place. Why? When you're traveling, you know. So the, of course, in that aspect, I understand. But it's also very important that the men, the young boys are told how to behave as men. They should also be taught how to teach, how to behave towards women. And I don't think we give enough emphasis to this as much. It's always like... I always hear like the girls this okay yeah but what about your sons do you ever educate your son to lower his gaze do you ever educate your son like i ask the people like do you ever educate your son how to behave how he should not you know how he should treat a woman because what happens is because of this societal structure that's been put in place it's made out to be as if that the women are to blame and that's not right yes are they the gatekeepers of Intimacy, I believe they are. Yep. If a woman says no, it's a no. They are the gatekeepers, and if a woman's fitra in that sense is corrupted, it can really spiral out of control. For a man, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has connect, created us, it doesn't impact us as much, but still the sin is the sin. But the point is that as men, we need to educate our boys much more. We always blame the girls as if it's the girl's fault, and oh no, she is her fault. If she no, excuse me, I'm so sorry. I don't care. Yes, you can say maybe, okay, maybe she dressed up in an inappropriate way. She is bringing attention to herself. Mm -hmm. True. But we can't say that she is to fully blame to that. Because at the end of the day, if we bring, out, bring up our sons in a manner, even if he sees a woman disrespecting herself, he wouldn't disrespect her. As a Muslim man, he needs to know better. And I said this when I was on the True Jewelry podcast. I said the following, I don't know if you saw the clip. But I said that. I said, I had situations sister, in my marriage documentary and I mentioned this in episode 3 or episode 4, where I was on a specific matchmaking site because I was a new Muslim. I had no Muslim friends. I had, like, I didn't know anybody. So I went on this website and then I was meeting up with these sisters with the intentions of marriage. And, well, let me tell you something. I have never been so disappointed because when I first came to Islam, when I looked at a woman who wore the hijab, niqab, abaya, I had I held them at high esteem. Maybe it was an unhealthy expectation, <laughs> but I didn't realize that, you know, they have their struggles, etc., which is normal, understandable. Mm. But yeah, to me, to leave a lifestyle of partying girls, you know, being around girls who are half naked and dressed up in this manner, that manner, which I was like, I was just like sick. Like I was like, I, I know I would never want to be married to a woman like that. Then going to that and then being on this website and then you're meeting some sisters, not all of them, some of them, you know. Uh, observing the hijab and they were literally calling me to haram full and outright haram yani. and to me that bothered me so much that i would utter statements which i regret today and i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me and i'm not even talking about foul language mm -hmm. I, I, I don't really i'm not a person that swears mm -hmm. but i would tell i would say to them stuff like take your hijab off and that is so terrible like mm -hmm. i regret oh, Allah, i ask allah to forgive me for even uttering that statement but it was such a jahil statement but the thing is though it's I, as a man, had to know better. Trust me, sister, like, I would tell you stories which, like, you watching the documentary, episode three or four, it's yeah. crazy. They would call me to the, wallahi, to haram, touchy, touchy. And as a man, I had to know better. As a man, I had to say, I'm so sorry, like, I've left that lifestyle and mm -hmm. I don't want nothing to do with it. And you're calling me to it. And I had to give them nasiyah. And mm -hmm. we, as men, should be in that manner where... Even if the woman doesn't respect herself, you should respect her. You should put sense into her. Not, oh, but she's moving a bit loose. So I'm, I'm going to, no, I'm so sorry, man. It doesn't work like that. In Islam, no way in Islam does it say, if a woman is calling you to zina, oh, you can go and commit zina with her because she called you first. This is nonsense. Yeah, yeah. This is not from our religion. So yeah, yeah. men should know much better. So should yeah. our women, but men should know better and we should focus much more on educating them on that i would say mashallah thank you for sharing that i don't really hear that a lot from actually for men especially that are you know to respect a woman that much you're definitely right and 
men should have self-control and should look at themselves just as much as women should. Um, men are supposed to be leaders. So who will women, if women are doing wrong, who are they going to follow? They're going to follow men. And if men don't know what they're doing, then they don't know who to follow. You know, they're going to then go around down the wrong path. That's why I say to my husband, you know, my daughters look to you. They will look to you as a man and they will look to you as what they will look for in a man when they get married. And the first man they ever love is their father. So I definitely agree with, with that, brother. Thank you for sharing that. Um, brother Mikhail was just saying, again, I'll just put his comment up, brother, because he said, um, as you know, he's an Italian, Italian ex-Catholic. And after telling his parents that he's now Muslim, they said that if he doesn't return back, he'll be disowned by his family, um, which quite is quite sad. I don't know if you have any... Um, advice for him oh you know again getting disowned by a family like i'll be honest with you my my dad my dad dis disowned me i think five times oh, uh, literally yeah five times and then yeah sometimes for the sake of the kids you know etc so it's obviously it's sad but sometimes you just become numb to it it's sad but you know it's it's like that it's, they don't come from a place of hate they care about you so sometimes it's just there to they're just testing you let's see how far we can push it let's see how far we can you know make him leave once they realize that you are adamant and you're following this religion they have no choice but to respect you mm -hmm. of course there's going to be days good bad they're going to you know switch at you etc that's a part of it man it's just part of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing you that very father who's kicking out of the house or that mother etc one day you might be praying salah shoulder to shoulder Inshallah. So bear that in mind. Look at the future, not just the present. What's happening? And you know what? Those moments when my dad disowned me or was, you know, kicked me out the house, etc. He brought me closer to Islam. It made me more stronger. Like my connection with Allah grew. So yeah, it's it's like like Allah says in the Quran, you might hate something which is good for you, and you might love something which is bad for you. Mashallah. Thank you for that advice, brother. Just one more. Oh, okay. uh, a big jazakallah for Brother Ali for being changed. We so desperately need in today's society change a life maybe including mine that's Mira. thank you for that uh, so we want to move on to marriage now inshallah um you have one wife i assume <laughs> uh, from what you i said. have the right to remain silent anything i say will be used against me in it was it court of defense was it court of, the, the court of law <laughs> yeah i will i will i will pass my solicitor said say no comment <laughs> yeah. is that your wife it's, with this oh no that's ishan <laughs> yeah uh thing to be honest with these matters i'll be honest with you sometimes i joke about this sometimes i talk heavily about this issue as well mm -hmm. um jokes aside it's, it's a very it's a serious topic in that sense it's it's of course we can joke around it and and i believe this like i've said this as well like i mean if if i mean you probably know your i believe like i don't know if you've had a discussion with your husband my yeah we sister. talk about it all the time in the sense, it's, you know, exactly like, exactly so the, 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 you talk about it in what sense though do you talk about it in the sense of exploring the idea or just him and within his nature how does the discussion revolve if you don't mind me asking you don't need to it's a, it's a private discussion you don't need to oh no it's we, we joke about it you know it's a joke but if he said to me before we got married it's something that he wanted to do i would then think okay seriously let's have this discussion but it was never a conversation and he's always known from me but it's not something that i personally could do if okay. A serious discussion, then we have to have the discussion. But I do think for a man, if you want to get married multiple times, it's something that you should air to the wife before you make her your wife. It's only fair. But you know, everybody each to their own. Okay. Is your husband watching this? He might be. Yeah. Okay. Now, me, sister. Let me tell you a bit, a few things about me. I'm somebody I like to deal with uh, reality. I like to deal with situations that are. Real, like in the sense where I believe there's Disneyland and then there is the reality. I believe in today's time, a lot of people are in Disneyland. Like they, they really don't understand. Now, I totally respect and never look, I'll be honest with you. If I know a brother is in his marriage and I would never ever go to that guy and start telling him, listen, go get a second wife. Never. If, like there's one brother, he actually comes to the Bitter Truth podcast. He even admitted like, you know, he is polygamous by nature. Every man, not a single man on this earth can come and tell me he's not polygamous by nature. I will put him on a lie detector test. I'll pay for it. So every man is polygamous by nature. However, that this doesn't mean I'm going to go and try to wreck people's family by saying, no, no, go get a second wife. I'll never do that. That's very childish and immature. I will say, bro, you can do it. No problem. Keep your happy man. I would even say, if that brother who is, for example, have never had polygamy in his head, like he, he, he is wired like that. Don't get it twisted. It's an area you can explore. It's wired. And believe me, 
If I was to speak to any woman's husband, I'll make it general, and I said to them, bro, your wife is totally okay with that. Totally, no problem at all. Not a single man on this planet Earth will say, no, nah, I would not. <laughs> Every man would say, brother, forget two. I want three and four. <laughs> Actually, if it's allowed, six, seven, and eight. So the thing is here is that Every man is polygamous by nature. These men that you speak to, they will say, oh, you know, if it wasn't for the headache. Okay, so there's conditions. So if there was no headache, headache coming from who? The first wife. Okay, good. So if the headache wasn't there, you would do it. Okay, so which tells us what? You are prone to do it. Now, there's one thing that you mentioned, which is very important. You said, if he told me from the beginning, yeah? Now, I'll give an example, like an analogy, so we understand. Sometimes sisters fall into haram, yeah? <laughs> And when they fall into haram, imagine, and I give this analogy so people can understand. Because the moment a woman says, if he told me that he wants a second wife, then that would have been different. Well, guess what? No woman on this planet Earth would marry a man that says he wants a second wife. Unless he is a man who is of, I don't want to use this red pill high value man. I'm talking about a man with taqwa, who fears Allah, who practices, who provides for his wife. He loves his wife. Yeah, A, a, a man who has these resources. Because to me, a woman is built to be polygamous, built. I, I, I'll tell this outright, because if Allah has legislated something, it cannot be that Allah has told a woman to do something that she cannot do. Because Allah says in the Quran, in, uh, in the Quran, uh, Surah 286, if I'm not mistaken, he does not burden a soul more than it can bear. So meaning that if Allah has legislated A, that means that is plausible to be done. So if a woman has committed haram, and she goes and tells every suitor that comes and proposes and says, by the way, I, I, I committed zina. Would any man want to marry her? No. Okay. If a man comes and says, I'm planning on getting a second wife, would any woman marry her? Probably not. Good. So a man judges a woman by her past and a woman judges a man by his future. Meaning, if when sisters come and say, but you should have been honest from the get-go, like argument's sake, and I'm not, I'm not wishing this on you, if your husband was to come and say, I've changed my mind, no, yeah? I, know, I know. We've had these conversations. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, if he was to come and say, I've changed my mind. I don't know what the conversations are. I don't know. I don't want to say yet. If he said, I've changed my mind. Now, you, can, you can't come and say to him, oh, but if you told me from the beginning, true, but it's as good as the woman who committed haram. She knows that every time she mentions it, she gets rejected, 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 rejected. So men, as men, I'm telling you, I'm telling you outright our mind. If I know, that I'm polygamous by nature. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell my wife because she's not going to want to marry me. Unless, like I said before, am I, I don't know, if I had some, I don't know, I was drop dead gorgeous or I don't know, it's, I was a millionaire or I, had, I don't know, I was just a very god fearing. I don't know, whatever it may be that, you know, woman that high polygamous by nature and she's like, you know what, I don't mind sharing this man. Argument's sake, yeah? So the point is what? This is the reason why men will never admit to it. Just mm -hmm. the same way a woman will never admit it. And what do we say to those sisters? That is a sin, yeah? Mm -hmm. That is a sin that's been committed, which you should hide, repent, Allah forgive you, yeah? No problem. So, it's a sin. Can we say a man has a right to? Okay, man's pre Okay, it's for hard for a man to imagine that somebody else... Oh. Okay, okay. But here is halal. This is halal. This, this is halal here. So, the point is what, my dear sister? And the reason why I'm emphasizing on this topic is why? Because every man is polygamous by nature. Mm -hmm. And the more we attack, and I say this to sisters who contact me, my, my husband wants to get a second wife, I'm going to divorce my sister. Just want to ask you a quick, simple question. Does your husband pray? Yeah. Does he fast? Yeah. Does he uh, give in zakah? Yes. Is he good to you? Yes. Does he love you? Yes. Caring? Yes. Ever hit you? This, that? No. This is a good man. You are out of your bloody mind to leave him. Mm -hmm. Clear cut. You are out of your bloody mind. Do you know why? Because you got, uh, look, my dear sisters who are watching this, do not for a moment think that the next man you're going to marry is going to be any different. Now, I give this example is from actually uh, thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics, and you're going to be thinking, Brother Ali, what the hell has this got to do with polygamy? The second law of thermodynamics is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Let me give you an example. These are my glasses. If I set them on fire, they have changed the form of energy and turned into something else. Mm -hmm. They haven't gone away. They've just changed form. Meaning, the next man you marry, 
He's going to come and say to you, Pelikimi and me? Oh, no, no, no. I'm so happy with you. Mm-hmm. Okay. And next thing you know, you catch him talking to another girl. He's either doing it in a haram way, or he's doing it secretly behind your back, or he's man enough to come and say, you know what? This is who I am. This is what I am. And I'm not going to do it behind your back because I want to be honest with you. And I call that man an honorable man. But for those brothers who also do it secretly, some of them I don't blame it because some of these sisters are on a mad thing. So what I'm saying is this, sister. This is in our nature. It's in our blood. Yeah. I don't want well, like, Let me tell you something. If I started a company, pharmaceutical company, and I said, I have this new pill. Brothers, when you take this, you're not polygamous anymore. I will sell out. Yeah. Billions. You know why? Because a man's thinking, bro, I want to take that. I don't want to be this, this, this innate desire that I have for another woman. I don't want it. Every single man on earth will take it. Yeah. We do not wake up one day and go, how can I destroy my wife mentally and make it? No, no, no. Wallahi. No man wants to do that who loves his wife. But it's in our blood. And one other point that I'll mention. It's as good a woman who wants to divorce her husband because he's polygamous. It's as good as me and your husband saying our wives nag. Every woman nags. Every woman. Trust me. It's like me saying my wife said something so deep to me and I'm so damn hurt. Yeah. But she was just having a moment. Just women are like that. They are sharp with their tongue. Imagine me saying I'm going to divorce you because you are keep saying things. That you don't mean That's within the nature Well guess what Ali Or what's your husband's name sister If you don't mind me asking You don't say it I would rather not No problem Let's let's call him The, the, the handsome brother Marshall. I'm sure he's a handsome yes. brother Yeah yes. The <laughs> handsome brother Yeah The same He says brother Ali He calls me and he says Bro I've had enough of my wife I'm like why He's like She said something really hurtful I go brother guess what So did my wife So did Zishan's <laughs> Well guess what bro If we divorce our wives Do you think the next woman We're going to marry Is going to be any damn different no so how about we stick to our wives the good woman of course they have their flaws we have our flaws so the point is what you are not running away from the problem as a man i'm not running away because the next woman i'm going to marry she might have another negative quality which is even worse so the point is what every man is polygamous by nature my dear sister and yeah. if one day i'm just saying it doesn't have to be if if one day for some reason whatever it may be he wants to explore the idea I say this not just to you, I say mm-hmm. it to all the sisters. Do not make the mistake of destroying your house and going your separate ways. Please, please, I beg you. Why? Because my dear sister, he doesn't do it because he wants to hurt you. He is created in that manner. Now, of course, there's going to be jealousy. The best of women to walk this earth, Aisha and has smashed plates. Mm-hmm. Allah told us in the Quran the stuff they did. Yeah. And some of the scholars even say they're not even blameworthy because it's just, do you get what I'm trying to say? That's yeah, nature, human nature. We understand and we accept you like that. Because as men, there's things that we put up with in the sense of our wives have menstruation, our wives are pregnant, our wives have menopause. We as men have a urge towards intimacy to a level where studies say there is no comparison. There are terms in times where we need to compromise. However, the point is what? If a man who wants to do it in an honorable way, and I'll give you sisters this hack for free. You don't need to sign up to my course. It's for free. If you do not want your husband to get a second wife, here's my recipe. Sprinkle it on the biryani if you like. Yeah. Let me tell you. Very simple. You tell him, if you ever want to get married again, you are going to marry that woman, not secretly. I'm going to know about it. You are going to give her mahar. You're going to do a walima. You are going to go speak to her dad. You're going to treat her how you treat me. And now let's see how many men want to do that. Because most men, they just want to do a little secret nikah, get married for a couple of months, and divorce the sister. But when you put these stipulations, and that's the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down, that's the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down uh, protocol to do polygamy. Why? Because it protects the woman. Because non-Muslim men do it. Side chicks, mistresses and girlfriends. Allah says you are not allowed to use the woman in that way. You want to do it? Here's the protocols. So now man is looking and thinking, bruv, mahar, walima, speak to the dad, another in-laws, la, no, I've changed my mind. (laughs) You get what I'm trying to say? So, (laughs) but if your husband can do that, then I would say my dear sister, whoever you are, Wherever you are, 
submit do not break your house because you know what's going to happen you're going to destroy yourself him the kids and everybody ask allah the one who's created the heavens and the earth to make it easy on you i'm very sure the one who created the entire globe it's not difficult for him to give you some peace make you understand and guess what allah says in the quran you might hate something which is good for you and you might love something which is bad for you our principles in islam is not this dunya i like what i want no as a man i have to go to war sister mm -hmm. and guess what which is worse me going to war and dying and my wife marrying somebody else or my wife sharing me with another woman mm -hmm. which one's worse at least i'm in her life half the time or whatever it may be i'm still looking provide and protect i'm still there for the kids i'm still the same ali what is the difference me when i go to war and i die my wife, with the inheritance that I leave, she's going to be having a happy time with a holiday with a new husband if she no. wants to get married again. So do you see when people come and say, oh, this is a man's religion, da 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 da. Excuse me. If it was a man's religion, I am better off doing this as a non-Muslim because there's no rules and regulations and I can just be with multiple women. No limits, not even four. Two. But Islam regulated it to four and put protocols in place so it is done in the right way to protect the second and protect the third and protect the fourth. And mm -hmm. let me tell you something. Just finish on this. Sorry, I gave a whole lecture. Oh, no, no, no. It's a passionate topic of mine. So, yeah, <laughs> and, and, and the reason why it's passionate is some people think it's because it benefits me. Yeah. Billah. Let me tell you, sister. Yeah? Yeah. I see marriages breaking down because of this. I know. And I'm saying this because I don't want to see the breakdown of the family unit. That's the reason why I started the Bitter Truth show. That's the reason why I'm working on a project behind the scenes. But the point is, is that, look, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated. And I know of a story of a brother who was getting to know a sister for marriage. I know this and I know it is the truth because I witnessed it. This sister said to him, I am, um, are you polygamous? He said, I'll lie to you if I said I'm not. So this was going back and forth and she said, look, I don't trust you. I, I, I fear you're going to go get married again. Okay. He goes and gets married to somebody else. Guess who comes back? Really? After you got married? Yep. Guess who comes back and guess what she proposes? A second marriage. Isn't that interesting? Now you tell me the mind of a woman. Isn't it bizarre? She doesn't want to share him as the first wife. But she comes back and says, I don't mind being the second wife. Do you know why? Because a woman is wired in that way. In the house, now you might be thinking, me? Never. The point is this. Depends who the man is. Depends. It depends. So for a woman, Allah has created the woman in that manner. Women are hypergamous by nature. So they look to this man who might be, I don't know, six foot, whatever. He's got wealth. He's a man of, is, is, like one sister said, I'd rather spend half the time with a good man than full time with a waste man. Yeah, that's true. So, 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 and not only that, a woman cannot cater to two men. No way. But a woman, a man, he can. So please don't ruin your marriage over that. And I say to all of you, if, if your husband comes, sit down. I know it's painful. It's this, but wallahi. And I tell men, if you, are willing to go behind your wife's back and commit haram, you are a coward. If you are willing to please your wife over the displeasure of Allah, you are a coward. Mm -hmm. So I would say, as long as you put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first, Allah will give you a way out. Do not ever compromise the obedience to Allah at the cost, like Allah says in the Quran to the Prophet ﷺ, why do you make what is halal haram on yourself? Because of your wives. <laughs> You're right, brother. And you know, I didn't actually think this was such a big topic until I started doing this online. And I've spoken to two brothers recently who have multiple wives. They have two. The other brother was having is, is in the process of having a third wife. And I was talking to them about this, and it was such a normal subject to them. And um, you know, everybody's happy. Everybody lives in a happy home. The wives are happy. Everybody focuses on their own relationship. And I didn't think, you know, I, we joke about it in, at home, but I didn't actually think that this was an issue for people. Actually, people go going through this is an issue. Muslims my age, our age, that are going through this. Um, so thank you for, for that. Um, and not only that, every household is going to go through this. Mark my words. Every single household, be they a Muslim, be they a non-Muslim, I hear these stories. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like, like sometimes my wife will come and say, yeah, like somebody told, like through a friend or a friend, oh yeah, she caught her uh, husband 
um, talking to this. And I just look at it and I go, really? Hmm, I wonder why. And I hear the story, oh, this brother was caught. Da, da, da. I'm like, hmm, really? I wonder why. Because now to my wife, may Allah bless her, because I have this like, mutual we have discussions yeah and wallahi may Allah bless her she's 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 an amazing woman may Allah subhanahu wa bless her wallahi I'm, I'm privileged to be married to a woman like her wallahi and again again i want to tell people who are watching this yeah if they knew the hell i went through with the marriage seeking process i don't want people to be like oh my god trust me wallahi I'll, i got tested i got tested so all i'm just saying is i'm not trying to make it seem and believe me me and my wife have some wild arguments so i don't want to give this i hate one thing i hate is these social media yeah, yeah. Uh, figures who make their marriage to be like, it's unbelievable me and my wife have arguments you and your husband have arguments yes. trust me very heated ones after so, you have children as well sorry especially after you have children yes this is a part of marriage so don't think marriage is like oh my gosh no trust me you know what i'm trying to say so the thing is this is going to impact everybody's marriage it should be dealt in the way the sharia has said so and i these little shaitans who destroy marriages mm -hmm. it mainly comes from the friends of the wife yeah mm -hmm. wallahi i'm telling you this is why allah has put legislation in place for women women yeah. are so easily influenced they could yeah. go to one friend they could be totally okay with the second wife issue not that deep okay they would go to one friend and the friend has to say oh my gosh did he do that to a beautiful woman like you mm -hmm. all hell break loose and there are little shaitans because they come and I've spoken to my my wife about this. For example, like situations, if this was to happen, etc. If you like, if you went to your friends, like etc. And if they said, and she she was honest, she said, if I went to my friends and my friends consult me and said, look, listen, he's a good guy, that etc. Be patient. She goes, it would really help me. Yeah. But if they came and said, oh my gosh, how dare he do that to you? Are you going to accept that? You should leave him. Of course it's going to be shaitan. I call them little shayateen. So be very careful. If if a sister's watching this, you have that kind of friends. Wallahi, they are homewreckers. Mm -hmm. They are homewreckers, you know? And most of them act as if their husband's not. Darling, tell me who your husband is. Let me spend two minutes with him. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah? And I'll leave that. I'll be like, mm, bloody hell, brother. So brother's got game, you know, uh, uh, halal game to, that you don't know about, darling. Uh, you know, I'll say, my dear sister, he's got three wives, by the way, that you don't know about. It's true, brother. And I think something I heard recently, and I, I completely agree with this, and I do this, is for women, um, keep your mind, and even for husbands as well, but definitely for women, keep your marriage private. Don't go and, you know, especially to family and friends, like you said, it's very easy to fall into the trap of venting and going, he did this and he did that, because people don't forget. People don't forgive. You will forget and forgive. And like you said, people don't forgive. And then, you know, that creates resentments and then that creates little shaitans in your ear. And it actually makes things worse. Um, so definitely agree with that. We we're just staying on to marriage. What advice you were saying about, you know, your, your, your um, seeking out marriage for you was a very difficult path. What advice would you give for brothers and sisters that are seeking out marriage? Right now, there's these social media apps that are, I don't know how I, I, I don't know. I, I've never done them. I don't think I would ever do them, you know, in the past. But there's this Islamic social media apps for Muslims that are looking for marriage. And that seems to be the new way of finding marriage instead of going through parents and trying to find someone. So what advice would you give to fellow Muslim brothers and sisters that are looking to get married? With my experience, my dear sister, what I've found is this year. Wallahi, the recipe is so damn simple. Wallahi, forget these marriage coaches or this coach or that or that. And Wallahi, I should tell you something. I have experience. I don't have a degree. I have experienced that, I swear to God, someone with my platform would charge £500 and it would be sold out. And I'm, I don't even want a penny. The marriage documentary that I'm doing, um, a few other projects that I'm doing, it's all because of this. Because I don't want the people to make the mistakes I made. Yeah. But besides that, the recipe is so damn simple and it's so cliche as well. Wallahi, billahi wa tillahi. If people just gave the energy and the focus to obedience to Allah, rather than I need to go and do this and dress up in this way and drive this car and look this way and do this and get my lips done and get my eyes down, get my eyelashes done, um, go to the gym and get my biceps done and my triceps done and get my nose done and get my teeth done and I need to look this way and I need to earn money and I'll be a high value man, da 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 da, all that kind of nonsense. Wallahi, 
if they gave 20% of the effort to the pleasure of Allah, prayed their salah on time, fasted in Ramadan, mm -hmm. gave their zakah, gave in sadaqah, that ob were obedient to their parents, stayed away from major sins. Wallahi, and Allah will test them. Don't think Allah's not going to test them. And when that test comes in that storm, where you are shaken, and believe me, I was shaken to my core. I can remember the times where I was so shaken that physically I was strong, but I mentally was so exhausted that I used to pray sitting down. I remember those days. But when you're going through all of that, and you say, oh Allah, there is zero excuse for me to miss a single salah no matter what I'm going through. And I'm probably going through this is either a test or the sins that I've committed. So it's a win-win situation. If it's a test, it's good. If it's to expiate my sins because I made a sin, alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. Wallahi, I'm telling you, my dear sister. Mm -hmm. And I say this from the bottom of my heart. Mm -hmm. Allah will open doors to you from places you can never imagine. Allah will roll a red carpet out for you. But we don't have the tawakkul. We don't have the trust. I might speak his corner and I have sometimes sisters or brothers coming to me. I can't mm -hmm. get married or this is not going in my life. Ask a simple, basic question. How's your relationship with Salah? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I hear? Um, um, I, and I'm thinking, La ilaha illallah. You don't even give the basic rights of Allah and you're here complaining about why is X not working? Mm -hmm. The entitlement is crazy. You violate Allah's laws and you're here like, oh, but you know, why is this going wrong? Um, duh, let me think about it. Hmm. Like it's, it's, it's mind boggling. The recipe is so damn simple, sister. Mm -hmm. If only we did this and we had Allah in our minds when we wake up to the moment we sleep. If we did istighfar. The mushrikeen used to associate partners to Allah. They used to mock the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and say, and Allah says in the Quran, they used to say to him, when is the punishment coming? When is this punishment coming? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the reason the punishment was not coming is because when they used to do tawaf, these are mushrikeen, they used to seek forgiveness from Allah. He goes, there's two reasons. Number one, because they seek forgiveness. Number two, because, oh Muhammad, you was amongst them, that we didn't send the destruction. So the mushrikeen who are idol worshippers, when there was times when they were sincerely asking just Allah for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And this is a mushrik. And we have Muslims who don't even do this, who don't pray salah, who's involved in haram. Like the Prophet ﷺ said, he, he, he pointed at a man and he said, what this man earns is haram. What he drinks is haram. What he wears is haram. Mm -hmm. and, then he is, and then he's surprised when his dua is not accepted. Yeah. The recipe is simple. If you do not want to follow that and take matters into your own hands, you're mm -hmm. going to do nothing but suffer. Mm -hmm. But the moment you put Allah first mm -hmm. in everything you do, Allah will give you this dunya and Allah will give you the hereafter. I know. Wallahi, I know men who, if they were non-Muslims, they would want a lifestyle of multiple women, money and this. Wallahi, I know believing men who have multiple wives in an honorable way. Because it's a desire of a man who have wealth, who have happiness, and all because they serve their Lord. Simple as that, brother. You want to live that high value man life? Turn to your Lord, respect, mm -hmm. obedient to him, and worship him. And mm -hmm. this goes to my sisters. You want that good husband who's going to look after you? Fix your relationship with Allah. Allah will fix your relationship in the dunya and with the people. One other thing I want to ask you, brother, was people that are married, I mean, how do you live a happy marriage, whatever that is? Um, I, for me, I think uh, being in a marriage, you know, a man should know his place and a woman should know her place. The roles are clearly defined in the Quran, and if you follow that, that to me is a happy marriage. Um, do you have any advice for people that are in marriages that are, are going through difficulties, especially after children? I can understand it can be difficult. Well, I... I don't think anybody can really talk about a happy marriage in that sense. Like where, like, of course, like depends on what, like, we define as happiness. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Yes. We are in this life. We need to understand we're here as a test. We're going to be tested and tried. If you have this perception of happiness where nothing goes wrong, I'm so sorry. You're having this expectation. It's like jumping to the water and saying, I don't want to be wet. Mm -hmm. it's, you're, it's bound to be 
tests and trials and days and she makes you go crazy you make her go mad she doesn't want to be with you these are part of marriage hardships are part of marriage but in totality there should be peace doesn't mean they should like there should, there should be peace arguments happen it's fine but they don't escalate they don't go to the places where it's physical fighting all that kind of stuff so all i can say is my dear sister one night there is no set recipe because mm -hmm. the best of the man that worked this earth had problems with their wives and their wives had problems with them so <laughs> that shows you that the point the problem is what our perception of happiness our perception of what marriage is mm -hmm. because marriage is marriage when you have a false expectation be ready for disappointment that's why i say stop living in disneyland i tell sisters mm -hmm. because your husband will come one day and talk about polygamy what are you going to say oh my gosh no sorry that is a part of it when the brothers come and say my wife makes me go crazy with the stuff that she says sharp raise a tongue brother that's a part of marriage hello welcome to marriage you cannot come and say now oh but no 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 brother that is a part of marriage mm -hmm. it happened to the best of men who, who the hell do you think you are yeah. do you get what i'm trying to say once yeah. we understand this then we can be like okay this is normal i'm not talking about your wife punching you in the face and i go that's normal no mm -hmm. or the vice versa i'm not talking about that i'm talking yeah. about these things are normal they happen so understand that there are things that are not permissible there are things that are now like well this is disturbing but we're not talking about that we're talking about relationship with Allah and if you do that and I'll tell you this mm -hmm. the obedience you give to Allah I believe this the obedience you give to Allah is the obedience you will see in your wife or your husband so much so the Salaf used to say that they would go and commit a sin argument's sake they go and they don't lower the gaze they look at a woman they would come home and their wife is wilding out they say it is connected to the sin that I committed that slip up I've done there, I'm paying for the price here. So the point is what? Unless you're tested, because we know, like Lut alayhi salam, Nuh alayhi salam, his, their wives, yeah? They were rebellious, yeah. disbelievers, yeah? yeah? Yeah. From Nuh alayhi salam, definitely. I don't know about Lut alayhi salam, I'm not sure, yeah? So I think even Lut alayhi salam, yeah. So their wives were rebellious. That is a test. Mm -hmm. But in general, if that's happening, brother, look at your relationship with Allah. When you look at your relationship with Allah, the obedience you give to Allah is what you will see in your wife or your husband. Trust me. MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah, you're very true. What, what my, would you see? My battery on my laptop is on 7%. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I can answer the last question, Shark. I can do three, four minutes. Okay. okay. Um, I was going to ask you about divorce. Um, because I know that that's a big issue just now yes. Um, yes. in the Ummah. And I was also going to ask you about Islamophobes. I know you go through a lot of Islamophobes as well recently, which is not good. Um, but lastly, if you we don't have much time, if you don't mind, brother, I'll just ask you this last question. Um, the Christian atheist online trolls are celebrating the fact that the scientific miracles of the Quran. Um, what if I have can I ask you briefly if you have any general miracles of the Quran that have affected your life profoundly, made you a better Muslim, uh, a better person? To be honest, I find it very interesting, yeah. Like this is something that is known in the Dawah for a long time. And I find it so funny as if like these lot just found something I, I well, like, it amazes me. I, I know repeat, it's I, so long ago. No, 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 no. You know what it is? It just shows desperate times call for desperate measures. And you know what I find it very interesting? Is that if you think about it, like the ex-Muslims uh, about a couple of years ago, the Christians, the atheists, the Jews, they were all on this like Islam is intolerant against women. Islam is tolerant against ex-Muslims, the capital punishment, blah, 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 blah. Isn't it amazing, sister? Just think about it. They were using this to avert people from coming to Islam. So they was like, oh my gosh, look how barbaric Islam is. Look how Islam says this, da, da, da. look, the, the Prophet done this, the Prophet. And now you have an influx of thousands, if not millions, public figures, massive personalities coming to Islam. Why? Because of scientific miracles? Nope. Linguistic miracles? Nope. Numerical miracles? Nope. Historical miracles? Uh, nope. Why? Because Islam's intolerance. 
It's like a big slap in the face from Allah, like tush, to every. It's unbelievable. Like people come and say, "Oh my gosh, Ali, you're the one who said that there is a capital punishment to murtas." Yes, I say that, and I'm proud of that. Mm -hmm. In an Islamic country, this is this, this is what Sharia says. So the thing is, I find it amazing. They're just dying to hold on to something, and people are flocking to Islam. If you think about it, sister, wallahi, if I was a non-Muslim and I saw the man to come to Islam, I would say there's something about this religion. Yes. Something. And it's amazing that they're coming and saying, you know what? The fact that Islam is intolerant. Yep. That's why we accepted Islam. And I'm like, yes. wow. My who God. needs scientific miracles? Bob, keep it. Thank My you. God. The point is very simple. The problem with the scientific miracle issue was what? People are using science as a yardstick mm -hmm. and misreading Quran verses to apply it just so we can be science. Please, are you crazy? Number one, you cannot. Science is not our God, Awud Billah. For me to be like, it has to fit the scientific narrative. Science changes. They're even doubting the Big Bang now. However, there are certain facts in the Quran where you're like, well, hold on a second. How could a man who's illiterate know that? For example, when Allah says that in the depths of the ocean, that if you put your hand out, there are layers and layers of darkness. So I'm not going to call that a scientific miracle. I'm going to say that is a very interesting fact that yeah. how could the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, have any kind of gadgets or tools to go to the depths of the ocean to know that there's layers of layers of darkness. We can use that and say that is an interesting phenomenon. Like how did the Prophet knew? Mm -hmm. That could be a miracle. I'm not going to call it a scientific miracle. But to go now and read something about the seven heavens. Oh my gosh, it's talking about the ozone layer. Who told you it's talking about the ozone layer? Who told you? Because that is the problem. And that's why I say this whole concept that the people have been using, it's nonsense. Oh, me measuring the Quran based on science, this is false. We cannot use it. Of course, there are certain facts that are established in science, which the Quran goes hand to hand. But other than that, this whole science and miracle thing, I'm so sorry. We don't need it. Mm -hmm. We don't need it. People were using it and we realized this is actually we're wrong. Because we're reading into the Quran and we're trying to make it, forcing it, forcing it to match the science, which science turns around next week and says, by the way, guys, we got it wrong. Well, I'm going to do uh, have a have faith of crisis, crisis of faith because of that. No, that's what I said. And I stick by it. hundred percent. I'm glad, brother, that you um, cleared that up because it was such a big thing that didn't need to be a big thing. Yes. Um, I just wanted to quickly ask you, Mr. Speed, said family like my brother Ali Dawa. I hope you answer this question. You're a Muslim, I'm a Muslim. Do you think it's appropriate as Muslims to reconcile with your Muslim brothers on YouTube? Gamsi, Sajid. Um, sorry, what's the question, brother Ali? So, yes, I hope you answer the question. You are a Muslim, I'm a Muslim. Do you think this is, it's a problem as a Muslim to reconcile with your Muslim brothers? Well, to be honest, like I don't even want to answer this, but just in a nutshell, yes. it's very simple. If you have these brothers, these two brothers, um, look, you go to these two brothers and ask them, can I listen to Mufti Mink? Nope. Can I listen to Ali Dawa? Nope. Okay. Can I listen to Nuan Ali Khan? Nope. Can I listen to Mufti Munir? Nope. Um, Sheikh Tahir White? Nope. Mohammed Ijab? Nope. This person? Nope. You can think to yourself, what the flip? What? So you guys are the only one that's guided and everyone's misguided. These two guys are known for nothing but to attack Muslims. Yani they and one of them was an outright backstabber. I was having a debate with someone who rips the Quran up and shreds it. And I had a debate with him. Yes, I acted a bit of immature and I was a bit cringe. Put my hands up. He went and backstabbed. Like I know the guy, my phone number. He can call me. He goes and does a video the very next day insulting me, calling me like his friend calling me an imbecile, imbecile. And I'm thinking, bruv, I'm here trying to defend the kalam of Allah. I can make mistakes. You was waiting for my, the opportunity for the very next day to do a video insulting me. And then guess what? They they write a letter to, you know, this David Wood guy? Yeah, I've heard of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is an outright enemy of Islam. Yeah, I'm, I'm, tapped I'm, in the head. He, he smashed, he, try, he tried to kill his father, by the way. Yeah, oh tapped God. in the head. They write to him. And do you know how they refer to him? Dr. David Wood. Oh An God. enemy of Allah, Dr. David Wood, Ali Dawa, imbecile. These people are the enemies of, which I tell you something. Wallahi, I've never seen them attack anyone more than they attack Muslims. Yes. So my problem is this. If you are so focused on attacking the Muslims, you've got issues in your head. Because Allah says in the Quran, the believers are those who are harsh towards the disbelievers mm -hmm. and soft towards the believers. You are the opposite. So the question is, there's a big question mark on these people. So please don't come to me as if I have a dispute with them. They have a problem with hundreds of duat. Hundreds. Do you know Islam Q&A? 
No, I don't. I don't okay, Islam Q&A is a very known, popular uh, website which you ask, you get fatwa. Okay. They tell you not to take from them. Yani, you cannot take from anybody except a couple of them. So, alhamdulillah, like, my issue is not with them. But yeah, no, I think... Yeah. I agree with, with people like that, brother. It's just it's guess the case. They're a cancer. Well, like I said, I'll tell you something. They are a cancer. Yeah, I told, just... stay the hell away from them. Yeah. Well, like, they will destroy your iman. I know yeah. brothers who used to be with them, who used to backbite me. They came and apologized. And they fell off the dean. I know two of them, two, three of them, yeah? Because when you join them, the only thing they focus you on about is this person's an innovator, this person's misguided. Go to their web, go to their channel. They do videos attacking all Muslims. Me, Muhammad Ijab, Daniel Hakikaju, um, Abdullah and Delusi. All they're doing is sitting, and the guy himself is an unqualified, he's not even unqualified person in the dawah sitting on his chair and criticizing people. You're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. Bro, have you done dawah in your life? Have you come out? Do you know any experience? Nothing. You're yeah. sitting in your seat, have no experience, and criticizing people. Mm -hmm. it's, most of it is it's just they think they have a way of Islam and they think that everyone has to be like them. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's what it is. I just want to say, and we don't have much time, but I just want to say to you, brother, just such good positive work for um, everybody for Islam. You're building masjids internationally with your Quran app. And uh, even going out on the streets and giving gawa, I love your street videos. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Um, inshallah, it benefited you as much as it benefited me today. And um, we can maybe do this again sometime. Um, I definitely want you to meet my husband because I think that you two will get on very well. 100% sister, inshallah. If you ever guys come, like we have the bitter truth, we're filming 15th of July. We have another one in August. If you do want to join it, it'll be a pleasure. Uh, you can come with your husband, you know, we can. I would love to meet him, inshallah. And yeah, my, usually my wife is there on set as well. She she um, manages the sister's side. So, uh, side. so yeah, if you can come to join the show, we've got different topics. It'll be a pleasure, inshallah. Because we're going to do an episode. Um, we do cultural episodes. We've got the Somalis that are coming and we've got the Moroccans. We're going to be doing Bengalis and Pakistanis in August. So if you want, feel free, inshallah. You and your husband or just yourself. It'll be an honor. Thank you, brother. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for taking the time. I know you're really busy. I appreciate all your time today. No problem. Just Thank you. May, Allah, may Allah bless you, sister. Give salam to your husband, inshallah. Thank you. May and Allah may Allah, Allah I mean, may Allah protect your marriage, inshallah, and preserve it and yeah, protect it from evil eye and all that. And please do not forget to do your adhkar morning and evening. Uh, your husband as well. Wallah, your public figures, very, very key. You have to do your adhkar morning and evening. Uh, believe me, wallahi, the Prophet Sallam pointed to the graves and he said, Do you know how many people are here because of evil eye? So please make sure your morning and evening adhkar. There's an adhkar app, it's on uh, Apple, iOS. Um, app store so if you can please do not miss your adhkar you and your husband very important because you are a public figure and yeah that's what I will say inshallah thank till you next, brother inshallah, thank you. May Allah bless you. your daughters and I hope you're right as well thank you very much Amen. take care assalamu alaikum